All right, we will get started here this morning. Um, welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. Um, as a reminder, please mute your microphones. If you're not speaking, there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, and then uh, as a reminder, also this meeting is being recorded. The code for CME today it will be in the chat box um, for those of you joining via phone. It is J A L P U W. Again, that's J A L P U W. All right. Um, so this morning we have. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Don Davis. Um, Dr. Davis received her MD and her PhD in pathology from the University of Chicago um, before going on to internal medicine residency at the University of Washington. Um, she then pursued fellowship in endocrinology here at the University of Wisconsin before joining the faculty, um, where she's now an associate professor in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. In addition to her cl clinical practice, she has an established research lab focused on pancreatic beta cell biology with a very long list of awards, publications, grant funding. Um, and so we are very lucky to have her um, presenting to us this morning. Um, please give your virtual applause uh, welcoming Dr. Davis. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for the kind introduction and the invitation to talk with you all today. Um, and I'm looking forward to spending some time with you guys and, and covering a bit about uh, medical therapy for transgender patients. Um, I thought I'd just, you know, preface this by saying, um, I think as you heard uh, Laura mention in the introduction, that uh, the vast majority of my academic work and research is focused around diabetes, but I have really kind of developed a passion over the years in, in um, helping to, you know, encourage uh, good quality care for transgender patients in our endocrine clinics. And that's something that I hope I can share a little bit with you today. So um, I'm by no means the world's expert in transgender care, but I will share with you a bit about um, guidelines and approaches and uh, any tips and tricks I can from, from our practices in endocrine. So let me get my slides to work here. Okay. So um, first of all, I thought we could start with just some basic terminology and definitions, which may be very um, basic to some of you, but some of you may uh, still kind of struggle with exactly how, how these definitions work. So um, first of all, uh, the, the main definition I wanted to comment on is sex versus gender. So as I'm sure most of you know, um, sex refers to the biological sex of a of a of an organism um, it's related to things like chromosomes and reproductive organs um, and hormone levels but gender is a social construct in terms of how um, an individual uh, feels about uh, their own individual identity and so these are two different words, and, and it's important, particularly as clinicians, um, that we try to remember to use them appropriately um, in talking with our patients and in presenting on uh, topics related to sex and gender. So uh, again, gender is, is a social construct, and so gender expression is really the outward manner of how an individual expresses their gender. Um, some people may choose to express their gender, um, you know, in, in other ways. So you may have a female gender identity and choose to express that in an outward way very differently than other people with a female gender identity. Gender nonconforming is um, a person whose identity differs from that assigned at birth. So this is another way to refer to patients or people with transgender identity um, they they may have so they would have been born and assigned a birth of male or female and then their identity uh, gender identity is different than that the important thing to know is that gender um, identity may be complex and it can be fluid so it can change over time and it may not be as we'll touch on at the end of this slide not um, binary so in other words a patient may not 
always identify only as female or only as male. Um, so again, important to to try to get terminology correct um, and thinking about how gender can change and be fluid. So transgender is the word that we most commonly use to describe um, as someone who is gender non-conforming. Um, and by the word trans or by the prefix trans, what we're referring to there is that their identity is essentially the opposite of their birth sex. So male identity with female birth sex or female identity with male birth sex. So when we refer in slides in this presentation, I will often use trans woman or trans man. What we're referring to as a trans woman would be um, someone who was born a uh, male with a female identity or a trans man would be someone born as a um, female with a male gender identity. So cisgender would be uh, the term for someone whose identity, whose gender identity is the same as their birth sex. So they are cis, in other words, they are the same. Um, and this is, uh, you know, somewhat, I guess, the opposite of a transgender um, identity. And um, I thought I'd just toss out this definition of cross-dressing or cross-dresser. So this is a term um, that has been used, you know, in the past and is still an appropriate term to use in describing how um, an individual may choose to express um, identity or just express themselves. So cross-dressing is a person who may dress as another gender, so their outward manner of gender expression may be different but they may not actually have transgender identity. So that's an important distinction to make. Um, simply outwardly dressing as another gender does not mean that there is a clear transgender identity. And then finally, non-binary, we touched on earlier, just identifies that um, uh, an individual identifies as neither male or female um, in their gender identity. So these individuals, um, you know, sometimes, as I mentioned, may have fluid gender identity and that they they move between male and female identity over time and other times they just choose to identify as neither. All right, so um, I thought I'd put this right up front and uh, the, what I really am hoping to get across with the this slide and the next two slides is, is just to encourage everyone on this call and to work with your clinic staff and schedulers and everyone who comes into contact with our transgender patients to ensure that we treat them with dignity and respect and that they feel comfortable in the healthcare setting. And an important Part of that is you trying to you remember to use preferred pronouns and preferred names for these patients. Um, so the slide I have here, uh, you know, is just a little bit of a joke. But if you're wondering um, whether you should use a, a certain pronoun in referring to a patient, you should not assume, you should not guess, but you should always ask. So it's perfectly appropriate to say. Um, at the very beginning of a visit, um, so what is your preferred pronoun and what is your preferred name? Um, gender specific pronouns, we all know he and she, but um, some of the other gender specific pronouns that patients may choose to use um, can be a little bit, you know, more unfamiliar to us and these include they, them, and theirs. Um, these are often chosen by people who may feel more non-binary or who just may choose not to overtly um, uh, select a specific gender identity for their pronouns. And similarly, uh, these below um, uh, various uh, ver uh, versions of Z, her, and his, hers, here and hers, and then others as well. Again, just so that you're familiar, these exist and these are something that your patients may prefer to use. I think the vast majority of patients choose either she, he, or they, but there are other options out there. Um, and it, it's gotten a little bit easier. UW HealthLink has made some progress in the last year, I think, um, due to a lot of hard work um, on many people's parts to include actual utilities in the um, in your health link uh, medical record. So this should, I think, help people to automatically use correct names and pronouns even if they don't ask. 
Um, and so this is just a screenshot I took actually of one of the patients I saw in clinic yesterday. And so you can see that we now have the option for patients to add their preferred name, um, which will show up here, but their legal name will still be um, be the first listed on the screen. Um, then over here, we, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we have um, their gender identity is listed here, not necessarily their biological sex. So their gender identity is listed here as female and their preferred pronouns, she, her, and hers are listed. And then if you hover over this female gender identity, you will get this bigger box, which includes their gender identity, um, legal sex, and sex assigned at birth. So, of course, I would argue that all these are important things to know when you're taking care of a patient. You want to um, understand how best to help them feel comfortable and what pronouns and names they choose to be um, referred to to buy, but also obviously we need to understand what their sex assigned at birth is and um, their legal name and legal sex is also important for uh, certain, you know, billing purposes and other medical documents. So uh, these are just many of the things that you can um, always want to make sure you, you double check with patients before you again assume um, something that may not be true. <clears throat> And I will say that, you know, this is one of the barriers that a lot of patients feel in seeking out health care, um, in particular, you know, inappropriate use of pronouns and inappropriate use of their non-preferred name can really be um, painful and triggering for many patients. And if that happens to them every time they come into a healthcare setting, they are just much less likely to come back and to seek uh, care in in that setting. So again, it's important at every level from the people who greet them at the door to the people who are in the clinic room um, taking care of the patient. All right, so just a bit about demographics. So the prevalence of um, transgender identity uh, really is, has not been well studied or well documented, but um, some slightly older studies have estimated that the prevalence is around four and a half to five in 100,000 individuals. Although I think everyone agrees that's very likely an underestimate. Um, and again, in this study they found, which is what continues to be relatively consistent, a uh, higher predominance of male to female transgender. And again, you'll see this abbreviation a few times throughout my talk, MTF stands for male to female. Um, and uh, a lower proportion of transgender patients are female to male. Um, more recent studies suggest an even higher incidence, as I mentioned, now about uh, somewhere around 1% of birth assigned males, maybe a little bit less of birth assigned females identify as transgender people. Um, and if, again, notably getting back to the idea we talked about on the first slide, approximately 10% of patients at a when, when asked when they were presenting for care at a gender services clinic, identified as non-binary. So again, within that transgender patient population, there are at least 10% um, who identify as non-binary. So the history of um, uh, sort of the medical uh, community's approach to transgender identity has been a difficult one, to be honest. Um, it has uh, been categorized uh, as a mental health disorder in uh, the DSM criteria, uh, which many of you know is, are the criteria that classify and categorize um, and define uh, mental illnesses. And um, therefore, it has been historically seen by the medical community as a mental illness and as psychopathology. In other words, something that is wrong with a person that theoretically needs to be um, treated or cured. Um, there's been a real lack of recognition by the medical community uh, to, know, to notice or recognize uh, this as an identity rather than a disorder. But we have in recent years made some progress here. Um, so in 2013, when the DSM-5 criteria were released, um, they removed the term gender identity disorder and they renamed it to gender dysphoria, which most people have seen as a, as a positive in terms of how we 
um, we kind of have reframed the thinking here. So rather than it, again, being necessarily a mental health disorder, what it is being described as is dysphoria or a feeling of, um, you know, struggling with uh, a lack of um, congruent gender identity to biological sex. So that has, I think, um, been progress. Um, however, there are still some other terms in the DSM-5 that uh, the transgender community is, is less um, thrilled about. <laughs> and, um, and unfortunately, just because that's how it is termed in the DSM-5 does not necessarily mean that's how it's, it, the terminology has not really changed more broadly in the medical community and lots of um, coding and other um, kind of standard approaches to the terminology and the definition of uh, transgender identity remains um, a challenge and, and some words that are you know, considered really not um, politically correct are still part of our lingo in, in the medical community. Um, in, in 2017, Denmark was one of the first countries to officially remove the classification of trans people um, as having a mental illness. And then the WHO, a World Health Organization, did the same in 2019. Um, but in this country, again, we still haven't officially uh, made any statement about that one way or another. <clears throat> and it remains on the DSM-5, which probably will be replaced for another several years or so. And transgender uh, people have ongoing challenges related to discrimination in all areas of their lives, including marriage, employment, access to health care, military service, voting, um, partially because of uh, discrimination in obtaining identity documents, sports participation, public bathroom use. These are all things that are part of the transgender rights movement and things that we as Healthcare providers need to have an understanding of and appreciation for in order to really provide good holistic care for our patients. <clears throat> and also, again, to provide them with an environment where they don't feel that discrimination within our healthcare system. So, you may have noticed that uh, public bathrooms in UW Health have been. Um, um, kind of reappropriated in some cases so that we can have. Um, non-binary bathroom in uh, many of our hospital included spaces and um, that was a big step forward again for transgender patients to feel comfortable within our healthcare system. And uh, transgender patients unfortunately continue to face really high challenges in terms of socioeconomic stressors and um, they are they face increased rates of poverty, um, continue to have a lot of stigma and harassment. Um, I thought this was a really interesting statistic. I hope it's true. I'm a little bit surprised by it. I, I am, it so this survey data essentially um, that five years ago, only 25% of, of people in the United States supported transgender rights. And um, let's see. And uh, that, that this number has increased to 62% in 2019. Um, so over five years, there's been a really increased, um, a significantly increased uh, amount of support for transgender uh, patient rights or people rights. But unfortunately, um, there's still a lot of barriers and a lot of stigma that are faced by, um, by this population. 54% um, of trans people have experienced intimate partner violence and 47% have been sexually assaulted in their lifetimes. 22% of trans people have no health insurance, which is quite a bit higher than the general population. 29% um, of trans adults have been refused health care by a provider because of their gender identity. Um, and I will tell you that this is not, um, this is still a recent and sometimes ongoing occurrence within our own health system. Um, even our own endocrine clinics did not accept transgender patients for hormonal therapy until just a, within the last five to six years. So it's been, um, it's been something that, again, we have experienced locally as well. And up to 30% of trans people have experienced homelessness, um, along with uh, general poverty rates being higher. Um, oh, goodness, I have no idea why that is all blacked out. 
Um, okay, well, um, these are, <laughs> it's okay, these are just images, so hopefully this isn't an issue going forward on all my slides, but um, what these images were was just to um, give you kind of the banners from, from some of the, the guidelines uh, that, that we use frequently in our practices. Um, and so one of the, and part of this is just to highlight that there are some guidelines out there that are relatively older and a little bit more out of date. And even the ones that have been published and noted here are still a bit out of date in some cases. So the, the field of transgender medicine is constantly growing and evolving. Um, so it is important to try to identify good up-to-date sources. So the Endocrine Society has clinical practice guidelines that were published in 2017. Again, I apologize that this is looking so strange. Um, and then the other two that I have here are um, the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, is one of the um, kind of national centers for transgender care. They have a really great website, which includes um, a, a published document on transgender care that has a lot of, uh, you know, guideline, uh, guidelines and recommendations based on evidence, evidence-based recommendations for transgender care. And then the one in the bottom is the WPATH guidelines, which are still widely used by a lot of uh, people. These are getting to be a little bit out of date. I think they were published in 2015 now, and they have some um, some recommendations that most of the current transgender community doesn't agree with anymore. But they are still um, they are still valid and, and legitimate place to start for some some guidelines in practice. And I threw this one up there because I, I actually did some searching before uh, this talk to see what was available from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And um, I think their last official statement um, on uh, transgender healthcare was published in 2011. There was some newer content available on their websites, but this was the last kind of formal statement. And um, again, it's almost 10 years old, and looking through it, there there are a few things here that are a bit more out of date. So, I although it's most the vast majority of this is still correct and and good to use, it's still I would recommend using a newer source for some of your information. Oh my goodness, why is this? Um, hmm. Okay, uh, so um, I don't know, Lisa. Do you want to try sharing your version of? My PowerPoint, or are you having the same issue with the? It's the same issue I checked. Oh my goodness. Okay. I have no idea why that happened. Um, okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, that's okay. I, um, what this, these are, I don't know why they're all blacked out like this, but these are just screenshots that I took from the Endocrine Society guidelines. Um, so hopefully there's not too many of those along the way. Um, but, um, I do apologize for that. So, but I can just kind of talk you through what what, what would have been on here, and then hopefully you can um, get a copy of those guidelines to take a look at. They are um, available on the Endocrine Society website, and they were published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Um, and you can get them through the Ebling Library that way. Um, so, okay. So, in the first step in um, you know medical care for transgender patients is is often diagnosis. And this can be a bit of a challenging one um, in terms of exactly how best to approach diagnosis and who should make the diagnosis. So again, getting back to some of the guidelines there um, and some of the concepts around transgender identity being a mental illness, there have been recommendations over the years that um, the diagnosis of transgender identity needed to be made um, solely or only by mental health providers. Um, and a lot of people have pushed back against that over the years um, for a number of reasons, partly as I mentioned, because we want to avoid categorizing um, transgender patients as having a mental illness. And um, secondly, because access to mental health care is not great and access to mental health care providers with expertise in transgender um, uh, people is even less. So in a lot of communities, there may not be a mental health provider available um, for a patient. And it, therefore, I think it's important that we try our best to expand the number of um, professionals who are able to make a diagnosis of transgender identity. 
Um, and so what I had blacked out here, what I had here that is not blacked out were, um, again, the DSM-5 criteria for um, the uh, gender identity, uh, or excuse me, for gender dysphoria, which is the current diagnosis. Um, and the DSM-5 criteria are essentially, again, I'm not gonna remember them off the top of my head, but basically the idea is that a patient um, has had consistent um, uh, feelings of being uh, non-conforming with their biological sex um, and having a gender identity that differs from their biological sex, and that they have had those feelings consistently over time, that they are not associated with um, the features of another mental illness, like, for example, delusions and um, other things in illnesses like schizophrenia or severe bipolar disorder, and that they are that these feelings of gender nonconformity are causing significant distress to the patient. That's where the dysphoria comes in. Um, and so that is the um, current diagnostic criteria again from the DSM-5. So I guess the point here is that what, what we're really looking for is for more providers to be willing to understand, um, you know, what it means to be a transgender person and to help these transgender people get medical care by helping them to have a formal diagnosis in the system um, and move forward with appropriate care and treatment. Um, and so that, that is step number one. Um, step number two then is, um, to, from my perspective, is, is often thinking about hormonal therapy. So I'm going to just spend a little time going over that with you and how we approach um, the initial uh, start of hormonal therapy in our patients. So again, the criteria um, that come from most guidelines available are that we want to see persistent um, gender incongruence with the biological sex, um, that the patient is capable and willing to make a fully informed decision about um, cross-sex hormonal therapy and that they um, fully understand the risks and the benefits that can be achieved with this, that they're ready to receive treatment in line with the overall goals and plan that have been outlined by um, the, pr the prescribing provider, and um, that they have included their social contacts as appropriate. This is something that, you know, again, is challenging and some people in the past have required that before a patient can start hormone therapy, for example, that they have had real real life experience living um, in the uh, opposite gender. But I think as you can probably imagine for many patients that can be very challenging to accomplish um, when they've had no, uh, no hormonal therapy and in some cases no diagnosis or mental health um, or, uh, support because, you know, just suddenly going out and presenting yourself as the opposite gender can be very difficult. And so we, we don't really require that sort of thing because, again, we, we understand that that's hard to do. And we prefer that a patient may, may want to start on hormone therapy first and then later um, start to kind of present to the world as, as their preferred gender. But it is important that their social contacts, particularly their close family and friends, are aware of their plans to transition um, and now start to present outwardly as another gender. Um, it's important to also under, take, under, do, take a medical evaluation so that you can understand the risks um, that the patient may face that are above and beyond the normal risks of um, hormone therapy. And then a mental health assessment, if needed, to understand the impact of their underlying mental health disorders on both their um, capacity and ability to follow through with um, informed consent and also to just understand how um, they're doing on the mental health um, um, conditions they may have, such as depression um, and others, and make sure that they have good support and care as they move through the transition process. And then informed consent um, for us really just involves clearly explaining expectations and anticipated outcomes and clearly explaining all the risks. And as I mean, I mentioned to you in a number of these slides, the lack of knowledge of all of the risks because we don't have a, a large body of evidence for transgender patients to clearly define what the risks for these patients are. 
Um, so we talk to them a lot about risks, but we also explain that um, a number of these risks are, are somewhat theoretical and we don't necessarily know the real uh, numbers in terms of their absolute risk um, for, for various things. And then finally, an important thing is to discuss the impact that hormonal therapy will have on their reproductive health. Um, so that they fully understand uh, that decision related to both fertility and often to sexual um, um, function as well. All right. Um, okay, so we'll start with male to female hormone therapy. Um, so in male to female hormone therapy, our goal is essentially to reduce testosterone and inhibit its effects and also to increase estrogen or estradiol levels. Um, so that's kind of the broad picture of what we, we are trying to accomplish um, with the cross-sex hormone therapy. And so the way we do that is to um, essentially provide estrogen in the form of estradiol. i put this up here just to remind you, as an endocrinologist, I have to include a pituitary in my slide um, <laughs> and remind you of the hormone um, negative feedback pathways. So... Um, sex steroid control of gonadotropins, this is in males. Um, so remember the hypothalamus produces uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH, which then um, stimulates the pituitary to produce LH and FSH, which then stimulate in men the testes to produce um, testosterone and in women would stimulate ovarian hormone production. So in men, testosterone is driven by LH and FSH um, and the testes uh, then produce testosterone, which does have some negative feedback, but primarily on LH and um, less so on uh, GnRH, but there's some in situ feedback on GnRH. But interestingly, in, in biological men, um, the predominant inhibitor of FSH and LH is actually estradiol. Um, and circulating levels of estradiol will uh, have the biggest impact on in inhibition of FSH and LH. So what this means for transgender care is that when we give patients estradiol, we're not only increasing their estrogen levels, but we're also inhibiting gonadotropins and therefore inhibiting testosterone production from the testes. So we sort of get both effects with one, one hormone. So again, I am very sorry, that's all blacked out. Um, uh, the, the main um, approach that we use for estradiol therapy is um, to use um, one of three various administration um, options. So again, I'm sure many of you as um, uh, uh, gynecologists are familiar with estradiol therapy, um, but the way we use it in transgender medicine is slightly different. Um, the doses are a little bit higher than we use certainly for postmenopausal women for hormone replacement therapy. But again, we are sort of stuck with the um, products that are being produced and most of those are targeted for postmenopausal women for hormone therapy. So um, one example is the transger transdermal patches for um, that contain estradiol. Um, most all of the patches that are available come in 0 0.1 milligram per day dosing per patch, which is an appropriate dose for postmenopausal women, um, but is often too low of a dose for transgender um, patients. So often patients need to wear multiple patches at a time. The picture that is unfortunately blacked out here is just showing you um, for reference that the patch, um, many of the estradiol patches are quite big. They're about this big and maybe the size again of a a matchbook um, and the patient may have to wear two or three or four patches a day to achieve um, appropriate estradiol levels. Um, so that can be challenging for them. Um, there are two brands out there, the, um, uh, the Minivel and the Vivel Dot that are smaller, about the size of a dime. And so those are my preferred option for patients if they can afford to them through their insurance that they're not particularly expensive. Um, to use the smaller patches. Um, and then these patches need to be changed twice weekly. And again, they may need to wear one, two, three, or even four patches at a time to achieve the right dose. Um, the reduced, uh, there is 
probably, I put in parentheses, reduce risk of thrombotic events in um, women on estradiol patches as compared to oral or IM formulation. So it does tend to be our preference. In, um, but the reason I put probably is because these studies are really complicated to really tease apart because the clotting risk here um, often is, um, you know, is being compared to, um, you know, different formulations or even different versions of estrogen. So ethanyl estradiol from birth control pills may be compared to uh, estradiol coming from your patch, and those have very different um, risks of thrombosis. So the point is, again, we don't have the best evidence, but that is the, uh, the general consensus that the patches have less thrombotic risk, so we do tend to prefer those as first-line options if possible. Um, oral estradiol is another simple, convenient way to provide estradiol to these patients, uh, one milligram uh, pills taken once a day. Typical doses are between two to six milligrams a day. And then intramuscular injection of estradiol, either estradiol cipionate or estradiol valerate can also be done. Um, usually starting at once every two weeks, but often patients do end up kind of requiring or requesting to go to every week um, injections to keep the estradiol levels relatively constant. The problem with intramuscular injections is that you get a peak um, shortly after the injection and then a trough effect as the injection wears off. So the pharmacokinetics of that are not quite as good um, in terms of consistent delivery of estrogen. And I just wanted to make the point here that all of these options are estradiol. So estradiol is the preferred estrogen that we use um, now for our transgender patients, um, although that was not always the case. Um, as recently as, if, you know, just a few years ago, um, many patients were still being prescribed um, conjugated equine estrogens or ethanol estradiol. <clears throat> Anti-androgen therapy um, is also often used as an adjunct um, to estradiol therapy. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, estradiol will directly suppress testosterone production, <clears throat> but um, often that is not enough alone enough to fully uh, block the effects of testosterone and so we often combine this with other anti-androgen therapies and again to just remind you of the endocrinology here um, we have gnrh coming out of the hypothalamus to stimulate lh um, which then would stimulate production of testosterone from the testes and then testosterone gets converted to dihydrotestosterone by 5-alpha reductase um, and both testosterone and dihydrotestosterone can bind them to the androgen receptor complex and lead to um, downstream effects. So the different um, options for antiandrogen therapy include GnRH, um, either uh, GnRH agonist given in a continuous administration, which ultimately desensitizes the GnRH receptors at the pituitary and suppresses gonadotropin production or GnRH antagonists as well can be used. Um, we can block at the level of um, uh, testosterone production from the testes using either ketoconazole or spironolactone. Um, and then um, we can also uh, inhibit 5-alpha reductase using uh, finasteride and, or dutasteride. And then finally, um, we can inhibit action at the androgen receptor itself, um, most commonly using um, spironolactone in this country. So again, spironolactone is our most commonly used antiandrogen. Um, it blocks the interaction of androgens with the androgen receptor, but also has some estrogenic activity and um, has some ability to directly inhibit testosterone production. So spironolactone is a potassium sparing diuretic that has been around for quite a long time, used for um, you know, hypertension and, and heart failure. Um, it is dosed in uh, transgender patients between 100 and 300 milligrams per day, typically either single once daily or divided twice daily doses. Um, the main side effects to watch for here are hyperkalemia, hypotension, and then just the effect of diuresis itself, having increased urination, and just making sure the patient's not getting uh, dehydrated or having impaired renal function. 
Um, so as I mentioned, another option can be 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. The two available are finasteride and dutasteride. These medications, again, block the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, um, but they don't block the production or action of testosterone itself. So these are less effective ways to inhibit overall androgen act activity, and therefore they're not really first line. Um, finasteride uh, is dosed 1 to 5 milligrams daily, and dutasteride is 0 0.5 milligrams daily. Um, the thing about dutasteride that's a little bit unique is it more effectively blocks the type 1 isozyme of 5 alpha reductase, which is the one that's present in the pilosebaceous unit, pilosebaceous unit, which means that this may have a little bit stronger effect on um, terminal hair growth, uh, um, which is something that we're trying to inhibit in our transgender um, women. And then finally, this is something that even if a patient has had really good androgen blockade overall, they may still be suffering from male pattern hair loss, which can be difficult, and this may be an adjunct that we can use to help with that. And then finally, the GNRH agonists, um, Gocerolin and Luprolide, are available options. We don't consider these first line in adults because, again, um, they're not providing estradiol. They're really serving only as a, a, an inhibitor of um, testosterone production. But they may be helpful in some cases, particularly if the patient cannot tolerate or has very high risk of using estradiol. Um, we could use these as an alternative. Um, they're often used in adolescents, uh, transgender adolescents, to help block puberty onset until the patient is able to really determine their, their overall plan for transgender therapy. And then um, just another note is that these are very expensive, and so we often do struggle a bit to get insurance coverage for these medications um, as opposed to spirtalactone and estradiol, which are still expensive but a little less so. So, um, And, you know, again, as a reminder, not every insurance um, option will, will um, always cover some of these medications, so patients can often struggle with with lack, even if they have insurance, can struggle with unaffordability of their treatment. And then finally, just a bit about progesterone therapy in uh, transgender women. So um, this is a bit of a controversial topic. There's been a number of, um, you know, kind of back and forth papers about pros and cons of progesterone therapy. Um, just to summarize, basically all of that is that um, many uh, patients and kind of other transgender, uh, you know, support groups and transgender communities have reported anecdotally that there is some improvement in um, how they feel when they take progesterones in addition to estradiol, particularly in terms of breast growth. Um, but at this point, that's still anecdotal. We don't really have any um, um, you know, clinical studies to, to document that. Um, and so for the, at this point, progesterones are not routinely used or recommended in the major guidelines. Um, and it is important if you are going to use a progestin that you are careful which progestin you use, because as you probably know, many or some progestins may actually have androgenic effects, um, and we don't want to use those in our transgender females. Um, in terms of the risks, they are likely minimal or absent, but there may be some slight increased risk of thromboembolism, again, with certain progestins. So the choice of progestin is important. The two that are recommended, if, if you choose to add a progestin, are the micronized bioidentical progesterone, which is Prometrium, or medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is Provera. Um, these have the lowest clotting risk and do not have any androgenic uh, activity. So again, thinking about overall treatment plan for initiation of hormone therapy, um, our goal here is to often to start, um, and again, this is a bit practice-based. We don't have a ton of evidence for, for most of this, but the, the general approach that I use and many others use is to start with escalating estradiol doses, starting with a low dose like one milligram oral or 0.1 milligram transdermal, but then titrating up relatively quickly over several months. And the goal here is, um, and then you may add spironolactone either earlier or later, with also titrating up to minimize side effects. The idea behind titration is to try to help promote the maximal breast development. Um, we know that from our experience with treating um, 
hypogonadal uh, girls who have not yet got, or young women who have not yet gone through puberty, that if we just hit them with full adult estrogen levels right away, it can lead to premature breast blood fusion and overall uh, less breast growth. So what we're trying to do here is somewhat mimic um, the normal onset of puberty by starting with low estradiol doses and titrating those up um, to allow uh, better uh, breast development. Um, the biochemical goals of therapy are uh, one thing that we do tend to monitor. We're looking to make sure that we've achieved adequate circulating estradiol levels in the normal uh, biological female range, um, but less than 200 picograms per mil so that we're not overdosing the estradiol too much and potentially leading to more um, complications and side effects. And then total testosterone of less than 55 nanograms per deciliter. Um, if you're using injectable estradiol, you want to measure that estradiol level at the midpoint of dosing um, in the middle of the cycle. Um, and the other thing to note is that there's been some recent studies about um, injectable estradiol and testosterone, actually, that intramuscular administration may not be necessary to achieve adequate levels and that these may be administered subcutaneously um, and still get good effects. So that may be a good option for patients rather than continuous intramuscular injections. But um, I just wanted to make the last point here on this slide that although we have biochemical goals of therapy, um, personal goals of therapy are really the primary guide um, and an important thing to remember in, in managing these patients that, again, not every patient has the same goals for how they want um, the outcome of hormone therapy. And again, some patients are more um, uh, non-binary or may not necessarily want certain female traits from their hormone therapy as, as strongly as others may. So um, what's really important is to at every visit really ask your patient how they're feeling about their transition and how they're feeling about the, the, the plan and the, the approach that you're using. And if they're comfortable and they're biochemically not at goal, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you don't have to continue to titrate doses upward to achieve a biochemical goal, um, we really want to focus on the patient's personal goal. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is not easy to go through. I, um, so male to female timeline. So again, I'll just say this in words. I apologize that the image is missing. Um, this is another important thing to lay out is expectations. So what can we expect to achieve with hormone therapy in um, the male to female cross hormone uh, patient? So really what we're expecting is some breast development, um, but often minimal, um, usually maybe achieving an A cup or very possibly a B cup, but um, A cup is sort of what we can um, expect to achieve. Breast development takes some time, and we usually say maximal breast development will happen after about two years of therapy. Um, and we can also expect to see um, some gradual changes in um, uh, some facial features, some redistribution of um, lean and fat body mass. Um, we can expect some decreased hair growth with the antiandrogen therapy and suppression of testosterone, but often patients do require additional therapy like laser therapy or electrolysis to remove excess hair growth. Um, and then the other things to expect are, um, you know, along with the suppression of testosterone, we often do get decreased libido, difficulty with erectile function, um, and we can have um, some of the side effects from low testosterone like um, hot flashes and other things as well. Um, so I think importantly, um, there are some, the other thing that a hormone therapy does not necessarily change much is we can't reverse male pattern baldness that has already happened and we also don't make a huge difference on um, you know boys and uh, Adam's apple and other sorts of physical features that are associated with um, with male identity so in some cases surgery is the only option um, to, to address those concerns but um, hormone therapy can definitely have some benefits but the timelines are longer, so the changes will happen gradually, often beginning in the first six months, but maximal effects often take up to two years. Okay, sorry about this. And monitoring, um, really what we're looking at, I already mentioned earlier that the goal of checking estradiol and testosterone levels um, to help guide biochemical goals. 
we recommend doing that every three months at the initiation of hormone therapy, but then that can be backed off later. And then um, other monitoring really is mainly just, again, looking for side effects and then monitoring potassium levels and creatinine in patients on spironolactone. Okay, so just a bit about estrogen risk. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, many of the risks are somewhat theoretical based on studies in postmenopausal women on hormone therapy. Um, as you all know, the Women's Health Initiative um, was a big part of, you know, changing our ideas about estrogen therapy, and um, that still is guiding a lot of the the concepts around risk. Um, so many of the risks um, that have been, you know, considered over the years were based on studies where transgender women or postmenopausal women were taking conjugated equine estrogens or ethanol estradiol, which we know have a higher risk of thromboembolism than our current uh, use of um, estradiol, of 17 beta estradiol. Um, so the, the biggest risk that is probably the most clearly documented is venous thromboembolism. Um, and again, it's highly variable depending on um, which studies you look at and which estrogens um, patients were taking in those studies. Um, but these are all studies in transgender patients. Um, a large study uh, out of the Netherlands found a 20-fold increased risk of thromboembolism. However, most of those patients were on ethanol estradiol, which we know has a higher clotting risk. Um, more recently, an international cohort of around 1,000 subjects only found 10 cases of venous thromboembolism, so a much lower incidence than what was reported in that Dutch study. And then another recent study of 330 trans women on oral estradiol now, um, which is again our preferred uh, estrogen currently, the venous thromboembolism incidence was only 0.6%. So um, while it is a risk and it is certainly something we need to talk to our patients about, I do try to present to them some of these more um, recent studies to give them a, a little bit more accurate estimate of what we think the risks actually are. And it's probably not nearly as high as was originally thought in those earlier studies. Well, that one worked. Okay, so female to male hormone therapy, we're gonna switch over now. Um, so in female to male hormone therapy, the goal is really to increase testosterone. And we essentially do that by providing testosterone therapy, either parenteral injections, um, transdermal, through either gel or patches. Um, and we occasionally need to add um, aromatase inhibitors as additional support to um, inhibit menstrual cycles. So um, testosterone formulation, so I'm guessing as um, ob guys, you don't prescribe as much testosterone as I do probably, so you may be a little bit less familiar with testosterone. Um, treatment, it comes again in multiple formulations. There's uh, testosterone cypionate and Enthanate, which are both an injectable, can be given IM or sub-Q, as I mentioned earlier, um, usually given weekly or every two weeks um, uh, to patients, and the doses, again, are all listed here. We have topical gel um, that is applied once daily. It has the consistency of, like, Purell, um, and it just kind of is applied to the skin, rubbed in, and then um, evaporates uh, and is absorbed through the skin comes in two different concentrations of gel. And then we have testosterone patches, similar to the estradiol patch, but these are changed uh, daily. And then we have uh, testosterone creams, which can be made in compounding pharmacies, similar to the gel. There's an axillary gel that's actually put on, sort of looks like deodorant that you put on every day. And then um, this is not actually preferred in the U.S., but I kept the name on here because testosterone undecanoate is also the um, generic name for the newest oral testosterone, uh, which was just approved in 2019. Um, I haven't been using this much yet, um, partly because it comes in a very fixed dose and it's um, twice daily dosing, so, so there's really not much evidence yet, and there's no evidence in transgender patients in terms of what doses to use with the oral testosterone. But I imagine that will start kicking off in the future. So the risks of um, female to male cross hormone therapy um, are really the same risks, again, with testosterone. And um, th these are from the Endocrine Society guidelines. You can actually see them here. Um, there's a very high risk of um, adverse outcomes. They, they um, point out that erythrocytosis and increase in hematocrit is probably the biggest risk with testosterone therapy. 
Um, this definitely has increased in patients who are taking um, parenteral testosterone versus uh, transdermal or uh, basically transdermal. But um, but it is a significant thing and is something that we definitely see is uh, an increase in hematocrit. Now, for some patients who have pre-existing anemia, this isn't an issue, um, but it can be an issue, um, particularly for smokers and others who may already have a little bit higher hematocrit. Um, and then other adverse outcomes, again, we'll touch on some of these, but um, these are all relatively controversial in terms of whether they truly are increased risk or not. Um, so severe liver dysfunction was really an issue with injectable testosterone, only not um, transdermal as well. And some of these others we're gonna to touch on later. So monitoring for female to male hormone therapy and testosterone, we're really just trying to monitor their testosterone levels relatively frequently at the beginning of therapy. We do that by measuring both total testosterone and usually measuring free or bioavailable as well to ensure that they're getting um, adequate testosterone therapy. And then the rest is just monitoring hemoglobin hematocrit along the way. And um, we do recommend monitoring lipids and um, hemoglobin A1C as appropriate um, based on guidelines because there are some small changes to lipids that can occur with testosterone therapy. Um, so again, measuring testosterone and the goal would be um, uh, to, to keep, oops, sorry, these are the wrong guidelines. I'm going to skip over that one. Okay, um, but measuring testosterone therapy, the goal would be here to get testosterone levels up into the normal biological male range, um, but not dramatically higher than that. Um, so that's going to normally be around 250 to 900 nanograms per mil for testosterone, total testosterone. Um, so the expectations, again, here, this is the... Um, the transgender male version of the slide that was blacked out earlier for the transgender females, we will often see, um, again, a cessation of menses within the first six months. Um, some clitoral enlargement, uh, vaginal atrophy can also occur. Some deepening of the voice here, um, increased muscle mass and strength, redistribution of body fat, um, increased facial and body hair growth often can take a little bit longer in the six to 12 month range before onset. And here you'll notice that some of the maximal effects here can take up to five years to see um, some of the maximum effects of testosterone therapy. So cessation of menses is an important one to just spend a little more time on. Um, this is a really important goal of therapy for a lot of uh, transgender men. Um, and so we know that um, with testosterone therapy, there will be suppression of gonadotropins and estradiol, although as I showed you in that previous slide, it's not um, as complete as we get when we are treating transgender females with estradiol. So testosterone has less of a suppressive effect on gonadotropins. So there often is still circulating estradiol at relatively um, uh, high levels, that is, you know, estradiol levels are not dramatically suppressed in women on testosterone therapy. Um, the majority of trans men will have cessation of menses with testosterone therapy, however, by six months, so about 85 to 95%. If they have continued bleeding after 12 months, that is considered abnormal, and I would recommend that they have an evaluation um, to make sure there's no um, you know, endometrial hyperplasia or some other reason. Um, and then we may, we often do then, if we continue to have some breakthrough bleeding, use aromatase inhibitors like an astrazole or letrozole as an adjunct to achieve amenorrhea. And the other ideas to consider are use of an IUD um, or um, ultimately having a hysterectomy if, if ongoing menstrual bleeding is an issue. Again, it's important to just be a bit aware of some patients may um, really struggle with some of these issues around um, not just having menstrual cycles when they don't want them, but also needing to have procedures um, on their uterus, for example, in search of an IUD or, um, uh, you know, a transvaginal ultrasound. So again, approaching these with, with appropriate care and concern for the patient's, um, uh, you know, pre-existing trauma and other issues that may, may that this may arise for them um, is important. <clears throat> um, thought I'd also add a bit about pelvic pain in transgender men. Um, this is relatively common um, and the general approach to workup is going to be the similar to as in non-transgender women. 
But again, remembering the low estrogen effects that may be occurring here leading to atrophy. Um, and um, importantly, vaginal estrogen may be offered to transgender men, even though they may think they don't want to take estrogen. It can ha help with the local um, impact of low estrogen while not providing a lot of systemic estrogen to them. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, I think on the previous slide, but remembering that there's um, a high percentage of transgender patients have suffered trauma, sexual trauma, and may be suffering from psychogenic pelvic pain related to depression and post-traumatic stress disorders. And there's unfortunately also higher rates of sexually transmitted infections in this population. So having a high level of suspicion for those and, and testing appropriately is important. And then again, finally, considering an IUD or hysterectomy is appropriate. Um, so fertility preservation, uh, prior to initiation of hormone therapy in transgender men or transgender women, it is important to um, have the discussion about fertility goals and offering fertility preservation if desired. Um, so both trans women and trans men may want to prior preserve uh, um, either their sperm or their eggs for future use. Um, and that is something that we recommend they do before they start hormone therapy just to ensure that they have adequate uh, ability to produce sperm and good quality egg production. Um, but uh, it, uh, the other important point I just want to make is that although fertility is often significantly decreased with hormone therapy, um, this it may be reversible with hormone discontinuation. So just starting on hormone therapy is not a permanent decision that you never want to have fertility. Um, and you know, if you were to discontinue hormones in the future, over time, it will take usually months to years, but your fertility may return. And this is evidenced by an increasing rate of pregnancy in transgender men. Um, so transgender men taking testosterone um, can become pregnant and, um, um, and somewhat unfortunately, sometimes can also have unintended pregnancy. So as we mentioned, testosterone doesn't fully suppress gonadotropes and um, therefore sometimes uh, patients can can become pregnant. So if preventing pregnancy is really important, again, considering an IUD or something is, is probably important if they are having sex with a male partner. Um, with testosterone discontinuation, however, for only about four months, a recent study showed that transgender men had similar egg yields during IVF um, after ovarian stimulation as cisgender women. So again, this is a reversible um, suppression and, um, and, and pregnancy is very possible. Um, during pregnancy, particularly an unintended pregnancy, it's important to discontinue testosterone as soon as possible um, to uh, avoid virilization of a female fetus. Okay, um, cancer screening. Um, so I just wanted to mention a bit about this. So age-appropriate cancer screening per guidelines for all organs that are in place regardless of hormone use is really important in our transgender patients. Again, this is is challenging in some cases and it does in quite it does require the provider to ask the careful questions about um, again biological sex at birth um, uh, any surgical procedures that they have had to remove um, reproductive organs and and knowing that upfront so that you can provide appropriate screening and care so in trans women um, it's important to not forget that they can still develop prostate cancer, testicular cancer, um, and, and that those need to be evaluated in the, if appropriate screen for. Um, breast cancer in trans women um, can occur. Um, it does not seem to be at a higher rate and in fact is likely at a lower rate than in um, non-transgender women. But we do recommend screening for breast cancer when significant breast tissue is present um, after the age of 50 or after five to 10 years of estrogen therapy. In trans men, um, it's important not to forget about cervical cancer screening and to remember that uterine and ovarian cancer can still occur. And breast cancer also, breast cancer screening is also recommended if they have not had a total bilateral mastectomy. And in all patients, colon cancer screening is important uh, as well. This is just a, a small study that one, I did with one of our endocrine fellows based on um, patients at our VA hospital here. And um, we were looking at whether they were getting basic primary care screening tests at the same rate as non-transgender patients. 
Um, and so this just shows breast cancer screening rates in our transgender patients were still unfortunately pretty low. Um, we're looking at two different time points here. They did improve significantly over time. And the major change here at the VA was actually in 2011, the VA mandated that transgender, uh, that medical care for transgender patients needed to be provided by the VA system. So we think that we hope that more patients were, were feeling um, welcome and, and seeking care in the VA system after 2011. And it does seem that rates of some screening did go up. So breast cancer screening is still only about 50% in our transgender women here in this study that we performed, whereas it's quite high in the control female population. Um, and uh, cervical cancer screening, however, was a little bit better in um, our transgender female to male patients. We didn't have a large number here, but they were still getting cervical screening at relatively high rates um, compared to control female patients. So transgender patients do have increased overall mortality, um, particularly in trans females. Um, a, a major driver of that is suicide. Um, up to 50% of transgender teens report suicide attempts and 40% of adult trans people have attempted suicide, which is nine times the rate in the general population. There's also um, higher rates of HIV and uh, positivity in trans women um, and malignancies at, from lack of screening and kind of um, ignoring kind of biological organs that have that are remain in place can also occur at higher rates, and then cardiovascular disease. I'm going to talk a little bit further about in the next couple of slides. Um, there classically has been uh, the thought that there's increased cardiovascular disease in transgender patients on hormone therapy, but this is confounded a lot by other risk factors. We know that transgender patients also have higher rates of smoking and other things than the control population. So it may be hard to break it apart. Dr. Davis, yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think we might need to wrap up soon. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. I don't have my clock in front of me. That's okay. okay. So That's okay. Hop ahead real quickly here. Um, okay. So I won't go through all the details on the bone health, but um, I just wanted to say again that um, there's not great data and the majority of studies are not uh, long term and are not in older patients, um, but we do recommend bone density screening um, and just to ensure no loss of bone over time um, per kind of standard uh, guidelines. Um, cardiovascular disease, males do have a higher risk than females. Um, biological males have a higher risk than females. So there's the theory that um, by giving testosterone, you may increase cardiovascular risk. And we all know that there's um, controversy about cardiovascular risk with estrogen therapy. I'll just say we don't have the answer here. We don't really know. There are variable results looking across multiple studies. Some say higher risk, some say lower risk. Um, so as of right now, the jury is still out on that. And for stroke risk, also highly mixed outcomes. Um, but this is a really important point I want to briefly make here is that we consider cross-sex hormone therapy to be life-saving therapy. In other words, um, we know that it makes a huge impact on patients' lives and, and can um, depression and suicide can increase if hormone therapy is denied or discontinued. So it's very important to not arbitrarily stop hormone therapy in the setting of a complication or like cardiovascular disease or other um, things without a careful discussion about those potential outcomes. And I will skip over gender affirming surgery because I think you recently had a presentation on that um, and just show you that there's really sources at UW. You Connect has nice online consent forms that you can use that both um, explain the expectations and risks and benefits of hormone therapy. And then there's a transgender health directory that you can use to help patients identify uh, transgender friendly uh, medical providers um, across the state. Okay, sorry about running over, <laughs> I apologize. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know that we have any time for questions this morning, but I will, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please email them to me and I will pass them on to Dr. Davis. So thank you so much. This was very um, educational, comprehensive, and um, a great review of all of this endocrinology that um, I don't know about everyone else, but I definitely needed a refresher on. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I'm happy to stay on if anyone has any questions and wants to stay. Great. Okay. great. Thank, thank you. you so much.